I'm also tired. I'm very, very tired. I'm tired of opening the paper and reading about women and children who have been murdered by men they trusted in their own homes. I'm tired of being afraid for my own daughter, for my own safety, and for the safety of women that I know, and even those that I've never met. I'm tired of wondering who's next. It's exhausting. Sometimes it feels like the louder we shout, the less we are heard, but we cannot be silent. The onus is on us to ensure that we take every avenue available to us to stem the scourge of gender-based violence in our country. And this is why we chose to host this event that looks at the cost of gender-based violence and on our economy. This is an aspect of GBV that does not receive the critical attention that it should. It is imperative that we bring into sharp focus the questions around violence and the political economy. Perhaps if we are able to draw clear linkages between G G GBV and its negative impact on the economy, we may move one step closer to affecting the change that we need to see. The Tumble Foundation opened our doors 10 years ago, and we've been actively working in the thought leadership space to encourage solutions-driven conversations around pertinent issues. For five of those years, we've been collaborating with ABSA to host the engagements and pass the Tumble values of ethical leadership, good governance, and integrity onto a new generation. We're genuinely so grateful to ABSA for their continued support, without which we could not bring you these engagements and these important conversations, such as the one we're going to have today. They are an absolute delight to work with and truly active corporate citizens. In the next few weeks, the Tambo Foundation will be hosting several more events that will honor the Tambos. These include our lecture series, which will kick off next week, Wednesday, which is the 21st of October, with intellectual giant Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, who will be speaking on democracy, dictatorships, and ethical leadership in a post-colonial Africa. If you would like to see more about this event or others that we'll be hosting, please do follow us across all platforms at Tambo Foundation. At, at, at Tambo Foundation. I want to once again thank each and every one of you for joining us today. I'm sure that this will be an informative and useful conversation, and I hope that you enjoy it. And I will now hand over to Ms. Rufula Maloto, our fabulous and capable facilitator for today. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, uh, Zhang, and thank you everybody for joining us today. It's a pleasure to host the second uh, event uh, of the Tambo webinar series, particularly now in Tambo Month, and how important it is for us uh, to really focus on this very scourge that Zhang is mentioning that is extremely and extraordinarily tiring. Uh, my job today is to facilitate the discussion amongst the esteemed guests that you would have seen uh, on the marketing collateral that you would have received that uh, invited you here. So thank you so much for joining us. Before I introduce those uh, lovely ladies, I just want to highlight a couple of housekeeping things to you. Uh, we will continue a panel discussion amongst the five of us, uh, trying really to draw through the key issues with respect to the economic impact. Uh, of gender-based violence on the South Africa, on, on the South Africa, on South Africa, excuse me, or, or the impact of gender-based violence on the South African economy. I think painfully too many of us are so aware, as Zhang mentioned, of not only the headlines that we see, but I'm quite sure as degrees of separation goes, each and every one of us has an anecdotal story to tell about how gender-based violence has actually impacted us personally. Uh, the social pain, the uh, societal uh, tearing is uh, very, very familiar to us, but the economic cost may not be as easy for us to actually crystallize. And it, I tend to find, uh, and I'm so glad that the Tumble series is allowing us to discuss this, that in, until things are put down in hard numbers, the hard numbers that women feel on a regular basis, nobody actually pays attention to the true cost as much as it may hurt us emotionally, psychologically, and societally. And so to help us unpack, uh, this information. Uh, as I say, before I introduce the ladies, just to let you know, I would really love your, we would really love your participation in this discussion amongst the five of us. 
please use the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen in order uh, to participate in this discussion. We will have time for Q&A toward the end, but as much as I can, I try to bring in your questions in the relevant point of the discussion so that uh, we can address it immediately. Uh, also, if uh, for those of you who are participating using social media, do remember to use our hashtags, hashtag Tambo webinar series and Tambo month. Uh, just uh, in terms of uh, bringing attention to uh, what you're actually discussing. And so without further ado, uh, Ms. Lisa Vetten joins us uh, right now. Lisa is a PhD fellow uh, at the Witt City Uni Institute at the University of the Witwatersrand with a plethora of experience uh, in terms of dealing with gender-based violence. Her career has spanned from counsellor uh, to legal professional all the way to researcher and therefore has had a vast uh, uh, ability and, and access to supporting women in this space. Ms. Baba Kubule is a senior economist for trade and industry policy strategies, a nonprofit uh, that uh, and has had a great amount of um, policy analysis experience and support in this particular area. Um, Ms. Nonkita Geisman is trying still to join us. She will join us shortly. We are dealing with the gremlins of technology, if you'll bear with us. She is a researcher, analyst, and women's rights activist, and also has been a parliamentary envoy for the past six years uh, as the head of gender for SADC region. And it'll be very important for us to understand how we stack up against our neighbors. Uh, and then Wosisi Wositole, Group Head of Transformation, Diversity and Inclusion, often seen as a very first step in terms of allowing women to step forward economically. And she does this for the corporation ABSA, with whom we partner today. Welcome to all of you ladies. Thank you so much for joining us and for bringing your brilliant expertise uh, and commitment to women uh, to this discussion. I would like to kick off, as I've said, we know the various areas in which gender-based violence hits us. Before we get to the to the actual number crunching, won't you help me understand um, in trying to find a solution? What is the most immediate pressure point for each for, in each of your opinions for us to address when it comes to gender based violence? Is it the socialization of it? Um, is it about the patriarchy? Is it about the economics and empowering women economically? Is it law enforcement or is it sexuality in which I mean sort of gendered norms? I'll, I'll ask that question of you first, please, Mrs. Sewell. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm absolutely excited to be part of this conversation today. And uh, Refilwe, thank you so much for your lovely introduction. Um, so for me, I would actually say that it's not any of them, uh, any of the areas that you have mentioned individually, but it's a combination of all. And the reason why I'm saying that is mainly because, you know, for a long time, we tend to focus on one area of dealing with a problem. And when we think that, you know, that is actually starting to be solved, then some, something else suffer, um, um, come up. So for me, there are quite a number of uh, interventions that are required from everybody, uh, including the corporate, as well as government and the society at large. When you look at, uh, for example, the law enforcement, um, there are beautiful laws that are actually there, and it is mainly about implementation. And every now and then we see our police uh, failing us, failing the women, um, but uh, it's not always the fact that uh, they just don't care, but uh, it's probably because of lack of resources where they are sometimes. Um, and when you also look at um, the education that you have also mentioned, there is a continuous need for us to continue to educate everybody, including our young boys, so that they grow up understanding that, um, you know, living in a world where you get what you want through violence is actually not the way to go. Um, but uh, the most important one for me is around empowerment, where we need to ensure that there are resources to actually deal with uh, the victims of violence. And there are also channels where the victims of violence are able to voice um, you know, their opinions as well as their pain, because there's a lot of pain attached to uh, what is happening. And corporates have got a huge role to play in terms of uh, ensuring that we are dealing with this, because you know, we're the ones that have got a whole lot of resources. So in the nutshell, there is a lot of uh, you know, hands that are required from different spheres, and there's a lot of interventions that are required. So I cannot say one is important over the other. 
Okay. okay. Thank you for, so much for that, Musisiwe. I'm going to turn to you then, Lisa. I think Musisiwe gives us a very important challenge here. Um, highlighting the complexity of a policy or societal response. You played a number of roles in these. If we had to think about the clicking, the, the ticking talk, excuse me, ticking clock uh, that we're facing at the moment, there's a sense of urgency that we have. Would you agree with Musi Siwa that uh, when you think about the most immediate pressure point? I don't want to sound as if Lucy Siwe and I actually sat in caucus beforehand around what to say, but I have to agree with her 100%. And if anything, I think that is our biggest challenge, is to be able to step back. And even under the face of this incredible pressure, and I think enormous grief that, that so many women feel every time they open up a paper, as your speakers and a view have, have highlighted, is to step back from that and to try and look at how are these things all connected. Because I think the more we try to focus on doing one thing now because of the crisis and the urgency, the more we are creating solutions that have a whole lot of unintended consequences that, and that come back to have very, very, very adverse consequences in the long run. So I do want to pick up on the one uh, area that BCC we highlighted, and that was around making resources available to services. Now, services have been in a state of crisis since probably about 2010. And what that means is that the number of shelters, the number of post-rape care facilities, the number of court support service programs simply have not increased. They've either remained the same or they've closed down or their services have not been in a position to improve because money has not gone to those services. And instead, I think because there's such an urgency to prevent, We've sometimes seen prevention responses being set up against services and people saying services are after the fact, you must rather put all our energy into prevention. Now, that sounds on the surface like a very obvious thing to say and do. But what we're not forgetting is that prevention takes a long time to work. In the meantime, those services are unraveling. There are women who continue to be abused and have nowhere to go. And all we're doing is reinforcing problems for children, especially boys who witness violence by not intervening in their violence now. So I think it is trying to take a holistic view and thinking that we're going to have to do many, very many different things. And if we focus on one thing only, we actually destabilize. And that there is a great value to putting money into resources. Firstly, it just communicates to women that they are valued, that society thinks sufficiently takes their difficulties, their suffering and their pain sufficiently seriously to invest the money in trying to do something about it and to intervene so it doesn't get repeated in the next generation. So again, there would be lots of different things we'd need to do. We also have to think about the way they work together, how some solutions can unintentionally undermine others. So it's about taking that step back and thinking about how are these things connected? How do we work in ways that we don't unintentionally have unintended consequences and where things work in opposition to each other? Okay, thank you very much. For this is the exact right place, I think, for you to come in, right? Um, Policy interventions are, something that, uh, are, are things that you've attempted to do, and I suppose avoiding the uh, unintended consequences of policy interventions, as the ladies have highlighted so far, is so important. Um, would you echo their words? And if so, you know, what have been some of the challenges for you from a funding perspective, economic funding of these very programs that they say lack the resources? Uh, I would agree, and thank you for having me before I attempt question. Um, thank you to the entire team at the foundation for having us um, and uh, giving us a platform to discuss a, a very necessary um, part of the effects of tea. Um, I would agree with my panelists. I mean, the stories that we uh, are bearing witness to reveal the nature the crisis. Uh, and I think it is quite interesting. I think uh, well, but in, if I'm to touch on something, um, and it's quite to locations. Uh, 
and with it all. I mean, it was less point eight six was said. We know that that is not me. Uh, and it's already is the last which before we get attended to any and to which are very Okay. Baba, um, I'm not sure if it's okay. I think your line is breaking up and I'm so disappointed because you look crystal clear, but I'm not hearing you as well as I'd like to. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to please, um, also, uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to just maybe go on mute and then just try and maybe uh, uh, um, adjust that. I, I want to, if you please keep listening though, because I want to pose a question to you ladies. I get it. We, we, we need to take a holistic approach. The, the fact of the matter is it's not happening. Um, and, and there is a, at the core of, of this, a, a, a very deep societal value issue that I think Lisa touched on that I was a quite important, I thought found quite important saying that the, the, the country and the world needs to actually learn how to value women. Now, um, some research at the Tumble Foundation actually shared highlighted that in a study in 2014, something like 28.4 billion to 42.2 billion rands worth of our economy disappears uh, due to direct and indirect causes of uh, gender-based violence. That's just under a percent to one and a half percent of GDP. Uh, that's significant. Um, but more recently than 2014, I think under COVID-19, we experienced a, a serious and severe perspective on this. I just want to read you a quote from the National Income Dynamics Study uh, and Coronavirus Rapid Sur Mobile Survey uh, conducted and led by economist Nick Spall and some others at uh, University of Stellenbosch and others. One of the findings that they had from those first three months of COVID lockdown were as follows. Women face a double disadvantage. Of the approximately 3 million net job losses between February and April, women accounted for 2 million. Two thirds of the total, even though in February, they only accounted for less than half of the workforce. Of those women who were employed in both February and April, almost half of them reported working fewer or no hours in April compared to 42% of men. Among those groups of people that were already disadvantaged in the labor market and already faced a disproportionate share of job losses from the pandemic, the less educated, the poor, black Africans and informal workers, women in these groups faced even further job losses, putting them at a quote, double disadvantage. I raise this because it seems it, one might want to highlight, you know, that these are just stats and this might just be a job loss. Maybe their jobs weren't as important, but that ties into some of the groundwork or the underlying factors behind gender based violence behind value. Um, and it really does indicate uh, the rapidity with which one is willing to let a woman staff member go. Uh, within their survey, there were anecdotal accounts of uh, difficulty in the workplace where when a male had particularly lost jobs in their, um, excuse me, a difficulty in the home, a male family member had, for example, gender uh took a greater hold. The woman who, who was still retaining the breadwinning role uh, faced the scourge of abuse, of uh, being abused for her money, of being abused um, for having money. Um, you know, maybe Lisa, you can give us a perspective with respect to having worked as a counselor, how, how, how these dynamics of economic power within the house hold, economic power within the workplace, impacting women within the lens of gender-based violence. What you're raising is so important to feel when I think a really unacknowledged um, aspect of the entire problem. The first, I think, is when women don't have money. One of the things that they've said is that they feel that they cannot make decisions in the household. They feel they themselves feel disempowered. They don't feel they can um, suggest where you want to live, what to do, what to do about children. You have to simply agree with the man because he is the one who is bringing in the money. So I think we have to really acknowledge this, the importance of money as a source of power in a household. And what, what, what I've sometimes seen, in, in, in actually not sometimes, but quite often seen, is that you can have what is almost the equivalent of two households under one roof. 
You can have the, the the man with his money that he uses to buy his things, and then you can have a second household, which consists of the woman and the children, who live on the amount that he gives them for food, for clothing. If they get sick, she must ask first. If the child can go to hospital, he has to be convinced that the child is ill first. So if you take a superficial look at that household, it might look like it's surviving, but inside the power dynamics are such that you actually have two kinds of households going um going on. The other difficulty I think is that is the way in which money gets split in households. Men tend to do things like pay mortgages, bonds, cars. They put their money into the assets in the household and women do the day-to-day -day things like buy food, small furnishings and that kind of thing. If the relationship splits up, he earns the things. She leaves with nothing. So I think that the economic aspects of domestic violence are incredibly important to the track. Because just to conclude on that, some of the things that women have said of those who've been, say, on economic empowerment programs have said that when they bring in an income, their partner's attitude to them does change. They start to be less accusatory of them as being a burden and a parasite and it's just eating their money, their money and they show them a little bit more respect and the women themselves feel more empowered to start saying, no, I don't agree or it's my money, we're going to do it like this. So money can play a very, very interesting role in the household. It can empower women to make decisions. It can also increase violence towards them because men will want to take that money and think, don't think because you now are bringing the money, you earn that, you now can make decisions. So it's a really, really important and I think under examined, neglected aspect of how we understand gender violence and its role in uh, reducing it or increasing it and changing it. But what we can agree on is, it sounds to me, uh, Lisa, what we can agree on is for women in many respects, when it comes to the economics if you don't. And That's right. Lisa, if, I'm, if you make the image, I think there's a bit of sound. Um, so I was going to say that I think what we can agree on is for women economically, when it comes to gender-based violence, or at least gender power violence is what it's actually about. You're almost damned if you do that and if you, and you're not. Well, I'd love to bring you this. Um, your focus happens to be on diversity and inclusion and transformation and your work at ABSA. Um, I think my my own social biases when I hear what Lisa is discussing is that I'm hearing the stories and the anecdotes that she brings forward within the context of possibly middle to lower income families uh, and maybe not necessarily in the professional space. But maybe you can share with us some of the challenges uh, that you face at ABSA in terms of inclusion of women economically. What are some of the key issues that women highlight um, economically, whether it be in the workplace or in the um, the home on the home front when it comes to power uh, or at least gender dynamics? Um, Refilo, I think what I'm going to do is to actually focus on the overall um, corporate world rather than focusing on APSA because then yeah. my response will be very limited um, if I focus on APSA only. So when you look at um, the transformation diversity and inclusion agenda, that is actually talking about including as well as bringing women to be part of um, you know, the, the workforce and add value. But when you look at each and every touch point where a woman uh, is involved, there is actually some subtle um, opportunities for abuse. So just taking um, an environment, for example, um, that is focusing on employees. So I'm going to touch on different aspects of um, of women, women issues, um, you know, both internally as well as externally, but focusing on what we look at from transformation, diversity and inclusion. So when you look at the employee life cycle, starting with uh, a woman applying for a job and coming uh, for an interview, there is, um, you know, a lot of times where women would actually be in a situation where they accept some kind of, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, um, some kind of, of, of abuse, whether it's in a form of um, how men speak to them or how men 
um, you know, engage with them in that initial conversation, um, mainly because, you know, a person is thinking, I'm here for an interview and therefore, you know, I can't complain. I can't already start complaining now. Um, so just there already when you come in, where you come as a professional who's skilled, sometimes you can face a situation where you are compromised in terms of your own, um, you know, um, your own integrity um, in terms of accepting when somebody is actually doing, uh, is saying some remarks that are unacceptable. So that, that's just one point. But when you are in the company as well, and, and again, this is not this is not about upside, it's about you know all the corporates out there, there's always an opportunity. And you know, often when we talk of an opportunity, it's a positive thing. But this time I'm talking about an opportunity which is becoming a negative. Um, there is always an opportunity for, for, for some sort of uh, abuse to come in. So when you look at the benefits. When you look at uh, the reward as well as recognition as an employee, you know, in in many management uh, position or in 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 a lot of uh, leadership positions, there they still um, males dominating there. So women find themselves having to always negotiate themselves harder um, in terms of uh, you know, for example, just getting that. Um, that uh, that voice in the in the boardroom, uh, you know, having to battle their way up in terms of uh, promotions, having to uh, to to get um, equal pay for equal work uh, compared to their to, to their women. I mean, compared to to their fellow uh, uh, colleagues, um, and um, also in terms of retention, the culture that is within the company, you find that women end up leaving the companies because. Of, of the environment that is actually not conducive to them working there. And when I'm touching on all these areas of the employee life cycle, it might actually sound like something that is, is, is not really you know, easy to happen. But looking at it, if you find yourself in a situation where you always have to negotiate a little bit harder, sometimes you find yourself in a space where you have to um, even if the person you're negotiating with is not acting in a proper uh, or expected manner, you tend to almost like accept that because you know you are you are now in a in a situation of a power issue here where the males have got the power to actually make the decision of whether you are getting an increase or whether you are getting um, you know a, a promotion or even whether you're going for a training uh, that 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 will position you to be more competitive compared to your uh, to your fellow colleagues and when you look at uh, the supply chain which then brings in uh, the women owned businesses to be part of the procurement uh, uh, for example um, you find a lot of women having to deal with uh, um, uh, having to deal with um, you know wanting to voice what they need and uh, be very frank about what what they want and what they are worth as entrepreneurs but at the same time you find that the other person on the other side who is a male uh, and I'm, I'm not saying all the males are like that but i'm just identifying quite a number of opportunities here where a woman would have to uh, almost again as an entrepreneur you know through the tendering process for example where you have to come and uh, present your business case, um, you know, there is a, a whole lot of males there who are looking at you and saying, "Okay, let's hear what you, what you what you're made of." But at the same time, some of them might actually even be naughty and and send some kind of uh, remarks that would make you uncomfortable. But because you're here and you're here to to try and get a deal here as an entrepreneur, you end up compromising yourself. And all these things, I'm not just saying um, them because, you know, it's something that's out there. But when you look at it very closely, for example, I've got a group of women that are mentoring who are entrepreneurs, very young uh, ladies that are mentoring. And uh, one of the sessions that we had were around ethical leadership, where we were talking about, you you know, you, you do not give bribes, no matter what, you know, you do not go to then an extent for you to get a business. And uh, a couple of them said, you know, that is one thing that everybody is almost like fighting corruption. But as women, we've got the second one that we are fighting, whereby if, uh, you know, there is no corruption where you need to pay a bribe, 
there's actually a sexual favor that somebody might ask or somebody might you know want for you to get this business deal so uh, when you look at it you know whether you are actually inside an organization as an employee or whether you're a small business and you're thinking you're your own boss somewhere somehow as a woman because of that power you might find a situation where you are exposed to that kind of abuse because there's still that power where a male do make decisions and you you have to you know to just follow with that and obviously a lot of women out there you know they they've got they're ethical and they, they can't tolerate that and you find that the society actually end up having more people who are unemployed because they, they had to leave their jobs or more women who were entrepreneurs who could have contributed to the economy by employing more and more people giving up on their businesses and saying if this is how i need to behave or this is what i need to accept for me to be an entrepreneur then i'd rather be an employee so there is a whole lot of issues there so they really are Musiwe, and thank you for framing um the way you put it the employee life cycle or i suppose the economic participant life cycle of a woman um, in terms of trying to quantify it, I mean, I'm going to use the employee stats and I, I'm going to hope that they're relatively representative. So we know now that the South African gender pay gap is about 25%. Um, it comes in a little bit lower than the global, which I think by ILO standards is around just over 65%. There are countries in the world, for example, Scandinavian countries that have enforced equal pay. They want absolute disclosure of equal, equal pay or excuse me, of pay statistics at various levels of corporations, and it is now legislated that men and women must earn the same. The hope there, I suppose, is that it overcomes the cultural or the societal discomforts that women may have with respect to asking for the raises that you that you mentioned, or it may overcome uh, the opportunistic um, demand of sexual favors and the like that may make a person sort of it make the, the workplace quite porous. People start leaving their jobs. Um, so I think that is quite important. And, and, I'm, and I want to turn back to Baba, but Baba, I'm going to ask you maybe if we can give it a try without video so that we can hear your voice clearly. Um, I want to come back to the numbers with you with respect to economic data. If that's what the gender pay gap looks like, so you already know that there's a 25% loss in economic Growth amongst women who are doing exactly the same job. We know that the the, the data is quite poor, excuse me, the workforce becomes quite porous for women who leave work because they feel hounded out. Um, Lisa and 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 Lisa Siwa have spoken up. And I think that they often for all of us who have worked in corporate know that speaking up comes with consequences. Uh, so gender-based violence is not only the person who salaciously approaches you in the office. It's not only the person who beats you or hangs you from a tree, it's also the person who supports those people, who doesn't fire the person who does that to you. Um, would you, as a policymaker, Baba, encourage enforced equal pay? And what other policy shifts would you encourage in South Africa to discourage this kind of behavior? Um, in answering your question, can you hear me better now? Clearly, thank you. I'm sorry I can't see your beautiful face. <laughs> I think it is better without the video. Thank you for that suggestion. I think it is important. I think Lisa uh, touched on this earlier for us to step back a little bit and reflect on the very function on, of violence and how it operates within the household, within the labor market, and how the state itself can actually perpetuate and inflict violence. And then we begin to understand that even when there is equal pay, that doesn't necessarily um, improve the bargaining power of a woman within the household or even within the market. Um, so, yes, it is one uh, tool to enforce uh, equal pay, uh, also transparency of equal pay. It's quite easy to enforce equal pay, but if there's no transparency about the, the pay scales, we actually could be gaslit as well within the labor market. Um, but there are other things uh, that contribute to making the environment more equitable. With the CWA touches on, you know, what it is to work in a decent work environment. 
the uh, incorporate, you know, the additional benefits that um, actually work in favor of women, particularly black women in the labor market, whether that is being assisted with your, um, you know, a small thing being how are you assisted when your parents die is uh, uh, the consideration of the fact that you have an extended family and if you need to take leave, you actually may not be granted that leave if you need to go to an, an unveiling. Uh, that could be recognition of social reproduction that black women do. Um, there's, there's a whole range of things that um, would actually uh, facilitate a more decent work environment for black women. Um, but from the public sector's point of view, I think that's where you are pushing me towards in term, terms of policy making. I think as we started this conversation, we were talking about, you know, many pressure points which need to be applied at once. Um, and one such um, that is actually happening at the moment is this idea of the basic income grant actually being uh, pushed in more as an extension of the uh, social welfare, uh, which was offered um, new, as a top up or either as new to um, those who, who qualify. Um, so there are many ways that we can think about uh, the different tools which are needed. So even from an industrial policy point of view, what sectors are you targeting? Just conceptually. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is just to say this is a multidimensional issue uh, which requires many responses. And I do also want to say that yeah. two, two, two things uh, to say that even as we um, and we'll see touched on this. Yes, there's been policies which have facilitate, say, facilitated the migration of women, more women into the labor market. But there are also unintended consequences. And I think we also need to reflect on that and how even a combination of policies which aim to um, support the most marginalized groups may not be intersectional, they, they design may not be intersectional, and particularly in a very unequal society, there are many groups of people, um, black women, um, who will be left out. Um, and I think the second point I wanted to make on this, and it diverts a little bit, is that um, just relating to the question of, of this particular webinar, um, the economic effects of GBV. I think the kind of data required to, and this is by no means saying that we should not advocate for uh, evidence-based economic policy development, not at all, we should, um, to be able to respond to the reality on the ground. But the kind of in data that is required for assessing the prevalence of GBV, for example, is never going to be perfect. You're asking rep respondents to uh, recount trauma, particularly during COVID, how are you going to isolate that person um, and uh, ensure their security? My point being, and there are many issues around the kind of data we would be collecting. It's never going to look like a census data. It's particularly sensitive information. My point again is that we cannot prioritize data, per, collecting perfect data over the safety of women. We simply can't do that. And also many policies and policymakers know this, is that we work with imperfect data all the time and we make political decisions. So for me, you know, the conversation around, yes, we do need to ensure, you know, more frequent data collection of this particular theme, but even that frequency, we should, you know, be very mindful of what we're asking um, survivors of and that the process should not, not be extractive, but that should in no way hinder us from actually making just a political decision about adequate resourcing around this particular issue which rests across a number of departments. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to there. So I couldn't agree with you more, Baba. I think the important reason, the important thing around data at the moment is quantifying in order to resource, right? So 
we keep saying that there are limited resources and it one can ask if it's as long as a piece of string um the the solution the solution to gender-based violence and at some point i don't mind i don't mind if we don't get a perfect answer i wouldn't have minded if any of the panelists today had said to me law enforcement first clean up the entire pipeline of the justice system or had said to me pause teach every three-year-old boy from now about carrying gendered roles and making sure that they're picking up all of the emotional labor in the household it's more than is happening now so for me i don't I, you know and I, I would i would like to give to everybody who's watching at the moment to feel free to send in your questions suggestions and comments in the q a box on the right hand bottom end of your screen um even if even if it's an imperfect solution which i think baba makes a very astute point about um it, we need more than a I imagine seminar, I imagine we need more than um, a march, we need more than a statement from a president, we need more than a government department. As you rightly said, this spreads across government departments. And maybe uh, this is a, the a, a opportune moment for us to, to welcome our guest who's been uh, trying to get in, uh, Nomkita Khaisman, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Nomkita is a researcher, analyst, and women's rights activist. Uh, for the past six years, she has been a parliamentary envoy to as head of gender uh, within the SADC region. Nomkita, you know, you would have caught a little bit of what Baba had to say just now. We're trying to frame uh, the discussion with respect to quantify, quantifying, and when I say quantifying, I, I am sensitive of what Baba said. Uh, one is not going to capture the pervasiveness of the cost of gender-based violence in a spreadsheet regularly annually uh but how do we how do we capture is particularly in the conversation i was having with Musisiwa a little bit earlier the fact that gender-based violence isn't just the headline that we hear it isn't the bruised or frankly damaged eye it isn't the hanging from the tree it starts in the workplace in the home in the value as lisa put forward a little bit earlier maybe you can share with us a few of your experiences uh from from how the SADC region has tried to respond in areas of gender. And where does South Africa stack up compared to our neighbors? Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Refilwe. And thanks to everyone for patiently waiting for me. I have been struggling to, to connect. Um, South Africa, as you know, I think it's number four globally in terms of GBV. And uh, I think it's ahead of every member state, state of the SADC region in terms of uh, GBV. Um, but have said that, South Africa, I think it's ahead of everyone else in the SADC, uh, precisely for documenting. We have quite a number of cases that we have documented, but it doesn't mean that we document everything. Because as the previous speaker has said, it's very difficult to, to document everything. GPV remains a very sensitive issue. GPV remains an issue that not, uh, that not every victim, the so-called victim, comes forward to report. And also how it is received. If you go to the police station, the attitudes that are there, it might not be documented as a case of GPV. As a result, you find that even the Minister of Police, when he gives us a report on GPV or rape cases, you find some gaps because not every case gets reported. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for that, Nomkita. Um, <laughs> I'm going to challenge all the panelists with this question, and I know I promise not to just throw one out, but feel free to either digitally put up your hand on your, you've got the functionality to put up your hand to answer this question. Often, I ask my friends, policymakers, colleagues, why we have a Department of Women, Children, and People with Disabilities, um, as opposed to a Department of Men, for example, uh, insofar as as a victim, as prey, there's not much I can do about being preyed upon. Um, <laughs> so with that in mind, 
Um, and the fact that we are not the ones who are, you know, committing the violence amongst ourselves and against ourselves. You know, how do you ladies feel about the fact that we are a little bit in an echo chamber of women at the moment in this particular discussion? How far can we get talking amongst ourselves about our common, our commonly held pain? Lisa, I'm going to nominate you. Okay. Do not underestimate the power of being able to share your difficulties with others. That breaking of the isolation, that sense that you are not alone is incredibly important to women. And I think also with that breaking of the isolation, you can get a sense of solidarity that there are those who will hear you and hold you and encourage you and cheer for you if you know in terms of making changes in your life. So I think I, I hear what you're saying about an echo chamber, but I think it's incredibly valuable in order to help women to to be able to move forward. But I think you are also making a very important point about men and violence. And I think, and in fact, to me, increasingly, I am wondering if perhaps we shouldn't be widening our conversation to look at the relationship between men and violence, because the problem does not just exist in relation to the way men treat each, treat women. It is very pronounced in the way they treat each other. And I'm going to use South Africa's homicide figures. So roughly two and a half thousand if we look at South Africa's murder figures, since 2012, they have been going up each and every single year. If you disaggregate and break that down by gender, you can see different things going on for men and women. The one group whose numbers are going up every year without fail is men. And the rate at which they murder each other is five times the rate at which women are murdered. So women's figures in the last seven to eight years have, have increased some years, decreased some years, but they've more or less remained in so I'm really starting to think if we shouldn't be looking at this relationship between masculinity and violence, whether it's manifested towards women or manifested towards men, because I am not sure you can stop, say to men, OK, stop hitting women. Um, but whatever you're doing to each other is just fine. You just carry on with that. I think we actually have to say we have to find a way to challenge and disembed violence from masculine behaviors and psyches altogether, rather than only in relationship to women, because I think. With the very best of intentions, we may inadvertently be reinforcing what could be quite a conservative uh, gender norm, which is the following. Women and children are more delicate, fragile and defenseless than men, and they need men to protect them and to look after them. And the reason you and that's the reason why men don't hit them is only because they are weaker, smaller and more def and, and more defenseless, because real men go and pick on each other on, pe on men their own size. So I think we've got to look very carefully at the kind of language and the way we're framing and positioning this, that we're not perhaps unintentionally reinforcing what is quite a strong gender a, a conservative gender norm and that we shouldn't be actually saying actually we need to do something about men's violence not only towards women but towards each other and both are wrong and possibly if we were to challenge that relationship at the same time maybe that's the way we could try and do something a little differently sorry i don't know if my signal is very bad no no um <laughs> if you can go on mute though the second you see me out of mute i'm I create feedback for you. So thank you very much. You're fine. So I like to stick to the things I'm qualified for. So Lisa, I, I love everything that you've just said, and I think it's very important. I don't know how women are going to do this, but but that's why we're here. We're gonna we're having this conversation. If I if I can drive this right back into the economic discussion, and we'll see where I'm gonna turn to you one more time. In many respects, when you speak about masculinity and violence, Lisa, and when we hear about the emasculation of men uh, from an economic perspective, um, we hear about, for example, as we spoke about a little bit earlier, women in the survey that came out from that cram, women are beaten for having jobs, they're beaten for not having jobs, they're beaten for not doing enough when they have the jobs, for not picking up the emotional labor, um, and maybe, Lisa, you're highlighting a very important point about not trying to focus on the, on the prey again, but also to focus on the predator itself. In corporate, maybe that's a great example that we can use, we'll see, see where. Um, in corporate, do policies of, and I think I, I recognize this at times with racial inclusion and racial transformation. 
But do policies of gendered transformation and inclusivity increase hostility and exclusionary practices amongst men in the corporate space? Um, hoarding of economic opportunity um, and the like, the, the, the more that one focuses on trying to include women. Um. I feel I think I think before I, I answer that question, I just want to answer your previous question. Sure. And uh, you know, part of your your question was around the fact that we are aware that we are you know a bunch of women talking to ourselves here, <laughs> and there are no males um, on the panel. Um, and I think that's very critical what you're raising because you know it it, it really doesn't help to talk about things as you know, as girls, um, without bringing um, males to be part of the conversation. Um, and uh, at APSA, we have actually, you know, realized the value of inclusion um, in dealing with uh, transformation generally, but also in dealing with gender-based violence. So one of the things that we have done is that we have actually, um, you know, signed up for a he for she campaign that is done by the UN Women. And we found that a lot of males actually want to be part of, uh, of this agenda. You know, it's not, it's not majority uh, of males who are actually, you know, uh, behaving in a, in, a, in a, let me just put it bluntly, who are behaving badly. You know, there are a lot of males who are actually, you know, respecting uh, women. There are a lot of males who are saying, not in my name. We have seen a lot of campaigns. Um, that are saying not in my name. So uh, I must mention and uh, you know acknowledge the fact that there are a number of companies that have actually brought in males and said, let's hear you, let's hear your perspectives. And that has really made a huge difference because when a man stand up and say, I am he for she, it means that he is saying that I'm going to stand uh, you know, by you as a male, and if there is an, any opportunity that I used to have in the past that you never used to have, I will help you and I will show you around in terms of how it's done. But most importantly, I will also protect you. I will not, I will not stand by and watch abuse happening while I'm there. So that's very important, and I just wanted to highlight that. And then in terms of the question that you just asked around the policies. Thank you. I mean, one of the things that I always... Yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt your thought process. I want to make the I want to make a very clear point. I'm I was raising for everybody who's watching at home, not not just in response to you. I was raising that uh, as a point of you know self awareness, but I want to just highlight the Tumbo Foundation was very deft and very focused about finding the best people to speak for today's topic. They happened to all turn out to be women. So I want to make that very clear to all of our viewers at home. Uh, there wasn't um, a specific intention to to um, to pack the bench, as is the common phraseology at the moment in the United States, with women. They happen to be that the people who are based at this uh, in, in the areas of discussion we wanted to cover happen to be women. But I wanted to ask the question for us to self-reflect. Please continue, Busisiwa. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and I also I also just want to mention that it's, it's okay for girls to talk. You know, it's okay. Nothing is wrong. Sometimes we have to. Um, so in terms of the policies, uh, one of the things that I normally say is that uh, the reality is that when you speak of uh, inclusion, at times inclusion becomes misinterpreted as exclusion for others. You know, um, so the policies that um, are normally there they are aiming at including as well as creating that diversity, um, you know, internally and externally for, for, for corporates. And it's up to um, the companies in terms of how they communicate those policies and the messaging uh, that they deliver that will actually start, you know, yielding positive results. So, so nothing is wrong with the, with, with, with the policies, but it's important that as you implement those policies, you actually take everybody along. And that touches as well on the he for she campaign that I have mentioned. When we deal with gender-based violence, we need to take everybody along to ensure that, you know, it's not about we are abused and you are the abused, but it's to say, how do we together 
find a solution for us to ensure that we are creating a better environment to work, um, but also we are creating um, an environment that is um, enabling economic growth um, where we are. And gender-based violence is one of those that is actually impacting the economy negatively, as, as we were saying today. Okay. I'm going to ask each of you to give me some comparative numbers, please, which I which I didn't prep before. But, uh, you know, as Wusisi was speaking, as Nomkita mentioned some things, we're 50 percent, over 50 percent of the population globally and in South Africa. Um, and I think everybody has highlighted the value of women's contribution to work. And. The fact that, yeah, I mean, you know, this is this is a very po large part of the population and, and we'd like to take everybody along. To me, if we're speaking economically, if I'm saying half of my workforce needs support for me to deliver better on the bottom line, that's just half of my workforce. That's not half that happens to be women, half that happen to be varsity students, half that happen to be living with disabilities, half that maybe, um, you know, uh, have different sexual orientation. Comparatively speaking, how do your budgets look for women issues as compared to general business issues. So if I'm thinking about, in your case, Musisiwe, how does a transformation budget look as compared to just the leadership budget percentage-wise? You can say corporate, it doesn't have to be ABSA, if you yeah. have a city yeah. the industry. Yeah, look, I mean, I think our triple B legislation has actually made it very easy for companies to start focusing on women issues and, uh, the fact that there is actually a framework that prescribe how much do you need to spend for training for women? How much do you need to spend for procurement uh, in terms of uh, you know, allowing women owned businesses to be part of your supply chain? That is actually making you know, the lives of the corporates easier. Um, and I've seen that, um, you know, again, I've spoken about the policy and I've spoken about the, the importance of implementation. Um, over the years, as, as somebody who is in the transformation space, I have seen a lot of companies really uh, doing bare minimum in terms of saying, if the legislation is saying for you to comply, you have to ensure that 35% of your procurement is um, uh, is black uh, black women owned businesses then they do that and when they get there they become excited and say you know we have arrived we have ticked the box but what we do not realize as corporate is that actually when we do that we tend to shoot ourselves on the foot because this is no longer about just compliance it is actually good for business it is actually um something that is providing that is giving a company that is that is doing this well um a competitive advantage and the minute we start seeing it that way and the minute we start uh, measuring what we are doing then that's when we'll start seeing um you know the impact of not doing uh, uh, uh transformation or even the impact of not having programs that are supporting the victims of gender-based violence so um in the nutshell I would say that a whole lot of companies, because of the legislation, they are spending quite a lot of money on, 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 on women issues, on women agenda. But the question is, are they going beyond compliance or not? And most of them don't. So I, I agree with you there, and thank you very much for, for your candor. You know, I have, the point I'm trying to get at here is that the woman agenda is a human agenda. Uh, the woman agenda is a customer agenda. The woman agenda is a future CEO agenda. The woman agenda is the very survival of the human race agenda. Numkita, uh, the SADC region, how do you think we stack up? I mean, South Africa is a far bigger economy uh, than, the, than our, many of our neighbors. So naturally, I think our budgets will probably look bigger when it comes to gender issues. But do you think that there's, you know, there's a fair distribution of resources when it comes to women's issues versus just human issues? Um, I've been asked to, the reception from my side is not uh, that good. Well, that's fine. And there was no voice. Uh, that I should switch off the video, hoping that things will be better. Uh, coming back to your, to your question, 
and also what you've just said about uh, gender agenda is not just an agenda of women. It's an agenda for, for everyone, like gender-based violence. It's a societal issue. As a result, I was happy to hear my colleague talk about the involvement of, of men in, in the fight, in the struggle to, to, to fight gender-based violence, in the struggle to have gender equity, gender equality. I, I must say, South Africa, even in terms of women representation in, uh, in politics, is number one in the region. In as much as we don't have that 50% that is required, but we, we are ahead of everyone else. And you, you must also remember that South Africa has got lots of laws which are meant to address gender-based violence, but unfortunately, laws alone are without implementing, it's as good as if there, there are no laws. And if we compare the countries in the region, South Africa in terms of revenue is well comfort, comfortable if you compare with other countries. We are still able to set our agenda of what we want to achieve. Yet the other neighboring countries, that is other member states, depend on fair foreign donation to be able to implement their agenda. Of course, there are well-off countries which can manage, countries like um, Botswana, in terms of GDP, Botswana is very comfortable, but to keep on going across the region, you'll find that it is so difficult to push your agenda as the country because you depend on Western donors. If, for instance, as South Africa, you feel that by 2024, we want to have, we want to have 50% of women in political decision making. And you find that some donor would say, we've gone past that. Let's look at child marriages. Let's look at sexual reproductive and health rights. Are we, as that particular country, are you pushing your own agenda or you depend on, on foreign donation? For me, the starting point as the country, you must have your own funding and your own priorities so that you have a, a strategic direction. Presently, other countries don't have that. And it is just a pity that also we're struggling at home. Otherwise, during the past few years, uh, we've been doing well. We were able to put our agenda on the table and we implement our, our agenda. Uh, leave it there. Thank you. Let's leave it there, Nomkita. Okay, so, ladies, I want to go back to Zang's opening remarks. You know, Zang said she's tired, um, and I don't blame her. I think I think we all are. We're tired of um, the headlines, and we're tired of economic exclusion. I I want to take our conversation a little bit. I'm going to step a little bit away from trying to dig into the data now, and I'm and let's just deal with the monster as it is, which really ultimately is patriarchy, which is as dangerous for women as it is for men. By the way, it, it hurts men as much as it does with me, women. Um, and I want to come back to two of your initial responses when we opened the the discussion with respect to the pressure points, which was. We need a holistic response. Let's say that we're looking at a barbell and on one end of the barbell, we need consequences. And on the other, we need uh, incentives for change. Um, I, I do want, I, I'm happy to bring it to you, Lisa. I'm happy to bring it to Baba. We may not say it's the only thing, but I do want to know what are the consequences that we can put down on the one end. Nomketa says, and very rightly says, Laws are useless that are not implemented. We hear anecdotes of women who go straight to law enforcement when they need to report a crime, are either discouraged from reporting said crime by men who patriarchally are protecting other men, um, have heard of police officers who encourage men to counter 
um, charge a woman when it comes to a gender-based charge or an abuse charge in order for her to then drop her charges in some kind of a negotiated uh, settlement. Um, we, we know that the justice system unfortunately has failed us in terms of, as we all say, lack of resources. What do we do about the consequence side of things? You know, if incentives aren't the ones that are working and if policies putting in, put in place, as Baba mentioned so astutely, don't necessarily shift the mindset within the workplace, for example. I don't agree with this particular suggestion, but some have said put forward the, 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 the death penalty. Um, besides my personal beliefs, I don't believe in the death penalty because our justice system doesn't even get us all the way to prosecution, much less conviction, and a death penalty is not useful if I can't get to sentencing. Um, but I would be curious to know your views on consequence, please, on the on the barbell strategy of trying to have a multi-pronged approach. Let's kick off with consequence um, and how that might impact how, how our society works and maybe how we're able to economically empower one another. Well, I haven't heard your voice in a while. Do you have some thoughts on that? Sorry. Um, uh, before I answer, I think you're pointing to some legal consequences, um, which I am not an expert in. Um, briefly read, you know, that there are some critiques of the jail system as well, which um, can also perpetuate um, what Lisa was. Um, can you still hear me, Rufido? I lost you for a moment there, my apologies. Can you say you can, um, can perpetuate with Lisa? Uh, I, I was agreeing with Lisa's point that, um, you know, when you are fighting against masculinity, patriarchy, um, jail in that context is not necessarily also the answer. Um, this is just some critiques I've read. I was just saying that I'm not the legal, I'm not a legal expert um, that can well, unpack uh, sure. what what you're pointing to. Um, and I, I just wanted to say, I, I think we do also need to be wary of um, catch all or silver bullet um, consequence um, measures uh, when we're thinking about um, fighting sure. the So we agree there is no catch all. We agreed that at the beginning of the, of the conversation, but, but at the moment we don't really have anything. So I'm asking if we had to start to cobble together a toolkit of solutions, and I agree, you, we, none of us here, I'll, I'll turn to Lisa for the legal expertise, um, but I was, I was really asking as a citizen, as a woman, as, um, as a person who might want to encourage, you know, as a policymaker, knowing the various levers to pull to encourage other areas of policy to work. Uh, could Busisiwa come to us and say, for example, one day that, in the knowledge that there is a death penalty out there, men kind of, the, the extent of the most violent crimes has pulled back, which has pulled back the extent of the insipid leanings that you see in the workplace. Um, Lisa, maybe you would like to give us a perspective there, just on a solution, even if it's not the whole solution. Okay, what I'm going to do then is try and pick up on some of the legal issues that you spoke about in relation to consequences. So firstly, I do think, as you already said, we should stay away looking right at the tail end of the whole procedure, which is punishment. As it is, South Africa already leads the world in its use of life imprisonment. Our use of life imprisonment since 2000 has increased by 818%. We are the world leaders in its use. And we now rank second only to the US for the number of individuals imprisoned for life. I do not think the US prison system is something we want to emulate in South Africa. So I think what we should be doing is looking at the nitty gritty, the detail of policing and prosecution. And there we have plenty of problems. One of the places we need to start, and these are complaints that have been made now for 15 years is around the police response to domestic violence. Now, there are very clear provisions already in the Act around the way you deal with police officers who fail to comply with their duties. They should be disciplined, they should be charged with misconduct, it should be reported to Parliament. 
That's been happening more or less for the last decade, but we're not seeing a necessary change in procedure. We have problems in the fact that provincial commissioners for police are not held accountable for those stations who fail to comply. There are no consequences for them. There are no consequences for station commissioners whose audits fail to meet the necessary minimum set by the by the Domestic Violence Act, for instance. So I think we have some very basic tools there that we are not using around the management in the, in the police at station level and at provincial commissioner level. We also, when stations are found non-compliant with the Domestic Violence Act, we never ever ask them to report back and say, what have you done since our monitors were there to make you more compliant? We don't do that. I mean, these are three really simple, really basic things that have been asked for for over 15 years, and we're not seeing the police take action with them. We have an opportunity right now, for instance, um, the Domestic Violence Act is being amended. There's a there is the opportunity for Parliament to tighten up those provisions of oversight over the police and the courts as well. And I also think there is an opportunity here for us to start thinking in quite concrete terms. You know, if you die in hospital, there is always a review of your death. What happened? Was there negligence? Was there fault? What do we learn to do differently? At this point in time, probably 5% of women who are murdered by their partners die with the protection order. There is no review. There is no investigation into why they died. It would be a simple thing to do is to put in place those review panels that if you or a child dies and there is a protection order, we need to find out why. Was there a police officer or a court official who was negligent? And I'm afraid that very often the answer is yes. But if they weren't, that would help us to start understanding who is this category of extremely dangerous men? What do we need to know about them? How do we identify them so that when we so that when we see women who are involved with men who are like this, it's a red flag and we can start putting those additional protections into place to protect that particular group of women because we can see that they are at very high risk. So those are just some immediately practical things we could do right now because the opportunity is open to us with the um, amendments to the Domestic Violence Act before Parliament that could start putting in place consequence management for police officers at station level and at provincial level and also trying to understand more about what's happening, why systems aren't working the way they should. Okay. The, the, the difficulty, of, of course, that we'll have is, you know, in general, the state is relatively failed in terms of its functionality so we might not get that um perfectly implemented but while we're busy ratifying and legislating i think that's a really great suggestion lisa you just mentioned a very interesting statement saying we need to establish who is this category of very dangerous men and how do i identify how they hurt women and when they will hurt women and a woman who happens to be with them um i don't have hard stats on this this is anecdotal but my understanding as a south african woman thus far is that we may say not all men, but the entire category is dangerous. It is, as I mentioned earlier, it is not just about the person who hits, it's about the person who absolves the person who hits, it's about the person who asks you what you did to upset him. Uh, it's These are all contributors to gender-based violence. And I've got a very painful uh, question here. Please feel free to continue to send your questions uh, in the Q&A box in the bottom right corner. Nomta Nabo from the Commission for Gender Equi Equality says my heart sinks when you talk about involving men in the fight against gender-based violence because every time when they are engaged in discussions they come up with excuses i.e we are abusing because how do you engage men such that they take responsibility so i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to ask you ladies to tell me who would like to answer that question because I don't want you to think I'm putting you on the spot from the perspective of your profession. Your expertise is obviously required here, but at the end of the day, your expertise as a woman in this country, as a citizen, um, and as a professional, I'm sure, uh, is very useful here. Nomsa, I'm gonna start answering um, that question while I wait for somebody to volunteer before I then pick someone in the class, as I've learned from my teachers growing up. Um, the first area of accountability that you're talking about, Nomsa Nabo, is in the name. So gender-based violence, again, puts the title, puts a lot of pressure on, on the prey, as opposed to calling it what it is, which is male violence. Um, 
And that would probably be the first point of accountability to have. Nomkita, thank you so much. I'm eager to hear your response. Okay. I hear you. Okay. Uh, let me give it a try. I'm one of those who believe that uh, uh, men should be involved. Men should not be involved. When men are involved, we, sh we should have clear terms of reference because it's not usual when they get involved. It's so easy for them to take up the process. It becomes their own process. They lead, they want to lead from the front and you end up following them. They should be involved because a certain type, a certain group of men, influential men in the society, those men who set up values for, for the society, men who are very respectable in the society. Like my, my other colleague mentioned something about he for she, the global solidarity campaign. Globally, you find that the heads of state are leading. At a certain level, we had also the parliamentarians who were leading. But I still believe that it should not end there, that we lead at the state level. It should be decentralized to the community. Have your traditional leader who's able to stand up and denounce gender-based violence. In other words, I'm the one who believes on prevention more than cure. You don't spend the money that we use for uh, uh, trying to, to cap GPV, taking people to the prisons. Is there a way that we can, we can have programs to, to prevent gender-based violence? One of those programs is the Global Solidarity Campaign domesticated to our local areas, domesticated to our universities. Every now and again, we would hear of incidents of gender-based violence. What are we doing there? As long as men have a specific role, I'm giving you an example of a respectable man in the society, men who set up values of the society. The moment they stand up and denounce gender-based violence, if it is that young man will start to, to listen. But we should not forget that at the end of the day, women are the ones who are suffering most and they should not give over to men to, to lead. And the other thing, Rafil, eh? the monitoring yeah. and evaluation. Yes. I find, I don't know whether the colleagues have mentioned it. Lisa I touched had, Yeah. Um, allow me to use the parliamentary language, the oversight. We can have very good uh, executive, good in the sense that we see what they do, but who oversees the executive? At the end of the day, the executive is supposed to go to the parliament and the portfolio committees should be able to ask difficult questions. And that's where the issue of statistics and the budget comes in. Let's say the Minister of Police is presenting a budget to be endorsed by that portfolio committee. It can't go to the House before it's adopted by the portfolio committee. The portfolio committee should have the necessary tools to be able to ask difficult questions to the minister and his team, to the Minister of Education, to the Minister of Health, and to the ministry with many uh, youth, uh, children and women should be able to ask questions to them. How much of this is dedicated towards preventing gender-based violence? If we can spend a bit of money on prevention more than addressing the problem that is there, the money that is used to, to feed the inmates, who, that particular inmate who's serving a life sentence, let's redirect it and strengthen the oversight role of the parliamentar parliamentarians. It, gives, it takes me to the next issue. South Africa has always been known during the 90s of gender responsive budgeting. We had something that was called the women's budget, 
we don't have it anymore. I think we need to take it back, the women's budget, so that parliamentarians have got tools and skills to ask the difficult questions. If you present so many billions, you should be able to say as the parliamentarian, how much of that is dedicated towards women empowerment? I leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nomkita, for that. So you use some really great parliamentary la language to speak about accountability, but you also led with something that was very useful, which was the terms of reference. So one would imagine that the portfolio commitment can you committee can use the terms of reference that we put forward uh, to hold a minister accountable. Similarly, I'd like to pose then to us, you know, what should our terms of reference be? My terms of reference would be treat me like a human being. Respect me like a human being, like you would yourself. And in the workplace in particular, um, recognize my effort like everybody else. Remunerate me like everybody else. where you have some nice terms of reference through uh, to which you would refer uh, within the transformation, diversity and inclusion space. Uh, are our terms of reference bold enough? Can we be fully respected as a gender if we are asking for 10% of the board, or should we just say, I compete for it all? Fight me. Yeah, I like, I like your last statement that says, uh, are they bold enough? Um, one of the things that I always say to women is that we need to remember that we've got the power. We need to remember that uh, majority of, uh, of South Africa is actually women. We also need to remember that majority of consumers of services and, 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 and goods are actually women. So which means that we've got the power to actually change the narrative in terms of, uh, you know, how corporates behave um, and also in terms of uh, how corporates treat women. Um, and uh, earlier on, you, you, you also asked around the consequences. You ask a question around the consequences. I think the terms of reference can never be the, a complete terms of reference without the consequences. Um, and one of the things that uh, I think it's very important is for us as a, as, as a country to actually use some of the small uh, initiatives that we think we have started and scale them and actually monitor them. So one of the initiatives that are coming to mind is, is the recent um, I think the, the, the Department of Education launched an initiative where teachers who have actually abused learners are listed some way. Um, and uh, the question is, um, you know, if they're listed some way, how exactly is that list used so that, you know, we can actually name and shame or even we can, you know, make sure that those offenders are not going to the next school and continuing and, and working as though nothing happened. So one of the consequences would be, why don't we actually have a some sort of a blacklisting um, for people who are offenders of sexual abuse? Um, and obviously, you know, those should be the people that have been convicted. And uh, we actually use that blacklisting the way the financial services use, uh, you know, the normal credit blacklisting. Um, for us to be able to, 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 to know very well that the people who are actually doing this, they know that everybody knows about them. And those that were even thinking about doing it, they think twice because they know their lives will never be the same after, you know, everybody knows that they're actually offenders. And so that can actually sound very simple. But for me, I think it's one of the behavioral changes that we can bring and bring very quickly and effectively. Um, and I mean, in terms of blacklisting in the financial sector, for example, people who are committing fraud within the financial sector, they're listed some way. So all the banks right. have got this, have got this uh, place where they go and check you before they hire you. And if that works, why can't we have something like that for gender-based violence of uh, offenders? You know, because then people will start to know that if they do this, there's consequences. Thank you for that, Busisi. I like the idea of consequences, and you're right. So Lisa mentioned just now um, that we're all waiting for this domestic violence bill. Amongst the things that we're waiting for is a sex offenders list that would be published for the for for us. I raise one little issue 
or one little snag. You mentioned rightly so because everybody has rights that it should include all those who have been convicted. Knowing the porous nature of our justice system, um, unlike in financial services where you can track the Edgar's payment I didn't make, and you can trace, you know, the late bond payment that I made. This insipid, insidious thing called gender-based violence doesn't always bruise. Um, it doesn't always leave evidence marks. And if we're only waiting for the convicted, we, I take us back to Lisa's point, 118% increase. I want to say, I think she said 1,018% increase in life imprisonment in South Africa. So this this thing of consequence is not a dis, it's not a disincentive it turns out, um, but it gives us something to think about and I appreciate that. I want to also touch on something else that both you and Nomkita mentioned, um, speaking about a teacher in school, um, and I want to take us back to the employment life cycle that you mentioned earlier. And here, and with this, I'd like to bring you back into the conversation, please, Baba. Um, a very recent situation which I think has finally resolved itself was quite painful. A former Rhodes student uh, spoke out, which is one of the things that we say doesn't happen. Uh, Yolanda Yanki, she spoke out against her sexual abuser in a way that wasn't palatable to the university. Mm -hmm. And she was excluded for life. Um, mm -hmm. And there are consequences, unfortunately, on, for the prey en route to getting consequences. We don't have to focus on the Yolanda Tianji case, but maybe just using that as a backdrop. And of course, your experience, Baba, as um, a member of uh, Rodents with Purpose, who, who try to support students in these kinds of situations. You know, what are, you know, there may be a few more rules within, within educational institutions. What are some of the lessons we might be able to draw from tertiary inst institutions around consequence? Um, that we could contribute to the terms of reference that maybe we walk away with that Nongkita and Busisiwe have started us off. Um, I want to go back a little bit to your terms of reference question. And we have a terms of reference. It's our constitution. Um, so for me, the Rhodes uh, example that you give um, points to the ways in which directly and indirectly uh, women uh, suffer the burden of, in the first place, um, speaking up about uh, violence inflicted on them, not only by an intimate partner, but by the institution itself. Um, yes, she was excluded, and she is now indirectly paying the cost mentally, not only financially, of appealing against um, the justice system. So that gives you um, an indication of what it means to actually wrestle with um, power. And the power um, not only uh, resting in a man, internalized um, uh, patriarchy, um, and the way in which, and I will, I'm going against, uh, I, I am an alum and I know the VC very well, a family friend, but I have gone up against him to say, you know, you appropriate the language. And then when it comes down to practically implementing something as simple as um, excluding the perpetrator uh, pending investigation, if it must be, um, is really a simple thing. Um, and she was also not given any uh, social support, um, which Rhodes has the capacity and the, the resources to be able to do. Um, so the lessons there are that, uh, again, I'll say violence in history and is evident now plays a function in society. Um, and it leads to a perpetuation of an unequal distribution of power. And it happens within a dorm, it happens within the labor market and within state institutions. Um, and holding those um, various institutions at various levels of society is extremely uh, costly, but also what is costly as that situation shows is also to keep quiet and exist um, in in that context. Um, and Rhodes is known when I was there, uh, 2005, um, was my first year, 
Um, this is well known to exist as a woman, as a gendered body at Rhodes, um, as a foreign national at Rhodes has always been um, a site of um, violence, really. Um, and this is a true, not only at Rhodes, but across many uh, learning institutions, which constitutionally are supposed to be offering the very opposite thing. So I think the lesson there is also that it is possible to hold an institution to account. Um, mm. And I'm very proud of uh, her standing her ground. Right, Baba, thank you so much. Um, you're right about that institution, institutional violence, as well as, I suppose, re-traumatization that we go through whenever we do have to fight because the rules don't uphold themselves. And so maybe your point there is also echoed in Nomkita's point about we sitting in terms of reference, letting the men join the conversation, but in order to avoid that appropriation of the language and the use of it against us, making sure that we continue to be the ones to lead. I want to apologize to Tobela and Gugwana. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, I tried to address the question around academia and the suppression through that road, road's question or with respect to Yolanda Dianchi. Um, your last question has come in very, very late, um, a public document that is easily accessible and spells out what sexual harassment is in every language. I'm hoping that is something that will come out of the domestic violence bill, which of course is, um, I think, under comment, so you are able to still contribute that perspective to it. I'd like to thank you all for your patience. I've actually run over time, but in particular, um, while we're not talking, if the ladies can all turn on their cameras so we can see your wonderful faces one more time. Um, I, I want to just uh, thank you all very much for participating this afternoon. Baba Tamana Kawule, Wusisiwe Stole, Nomkita Geisman, Lisa Vetten, thank you very much for giving your insightful uh, commentary to such a complex and um, impossible and slippery subject. Before we go away, um, I would like to hand over to our partner uh, in delivering these Tambo webinar series, ABSA, represented at this particular point by Vive Kaleane, excuse me, who's uh, the manager of stakeholder relations and group marketing and corporate relations at ABSA. Vive, thank you so much. Uh, please take it away. Thank you, Rishibwe. All. Uh, mine is a very short task. Um, I would like to thank everyone for taking their time to attend today's discussion. Uh, it really has been an engaging conversation um, on a matter that is central to the health of our society. Um, the scourge of gender-based viol gender violence does not only hurt um, the people who are subjected to it, but also destroys families and by extension, you know, the fiber of our society. And so I'd like to thank uh, the panelists sincerely for their insights and in helping us make um, sense of the high cost of GBV to our economy. The focus of many discussions about GBV has predominantly been on the human impact. And today's discussion um, is for me an important step towards adopting a holistic approach in, in dealing with gender-based violence. Um, to our partners, the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, Thank you for your unwavering commitment um, to ensuring that these kinds of conversations do happen. Uh, they encourage us to reflect on the role that each and every one of us can play in dealing decisively with this problem. Thank you, Zeng, and your team, uh, Natasha Nolwazi and Butsilo. I uh, would also like to thank you, Rifilwe, as our fabulous um, uh, program director, um, and for being such a, you know, a good steer. And to my colleagues at APSA, Mrs. Siwe, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here today. And to our Head of Stakeholder Relations, Njaji Petros, thank you for your strategic um, strat direction. And to our editorial team led by Pal Sibulao, thank you for the support. Once again, sincere thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Viewer, for that representation from uh, the Tumble Fund, for, excuse me, from Zingi Zimsamang, CEO of the Tambo Foundation, thank you so much for opening this wonderful uh, discussion, necessary as painful as it is. Tasha Ali for your consistent support.
And please, can you all fo fo follow the Tumble Foundation on at Tumble Foundation on all social media platforms, uh, Twitter, as well as on, uh, on Instagram, on Facebook, just search Tumble Foundation. And do remember after this uh, to fill out a very quick survey just to let us know how this went so that we can always improve the Tumble webinar series for you. Uh, if you are commenting on social media, hashtag Tumble se Seminar. Tumble webinar series and hashtag Tumble month are your hashtags. And of course, if you do stay tuned to those uh, social media accounts, you'll find out about the next of our discussions, very important discussions in the South African landscape right here with the Tumble Foundation. Have a wonderful afternoon.